some trades in the NBA are really good. Like, remember when the Lakers traded the rights to one Gasol brother for the other? That was a good one. And there are bad trades. Remember that time when the Bulls traded Scottie Pippen for basically nothing, only for the Rockets to lose him a year later? Both teams kind of lost there. And then there are trades that give you that thousand yard stare. Like what happened here? Well, guess what? The last decade was full of these trades and we need to talk about it. From teams trading away their future to bad doctor's examinations that lead to NBA titles, here are the worst trades of the 2010s. Okay, we need to start off with the Celtics and the Nets in 2013. The Nets received Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, and Jason Terry. And the Celtics received a 2014, 2016, and 2018 first round picks, a 2017 pick swap, Gerald Wallace, Chris Humphreys, Chris Joseph, Marshawn Brooks, Keith Bogans. Not only is this the most known trade on this list and is definitely the worst trade of the decade, but it just might possibly be the worst trade in NBA history. So how did this trade happen? The situation is kind of hilarious. Also, Billy King, the Nets then GM, and the guy who often gets blamed for the situation wasn't actually the one responsible. After being a serious contender in the East for half a decade, the Nets went into a slump. They lost all their key players, Jason Kidd, Kenyon Martin, Richard Jefferson, Vince Carter, and were ready for a rebuild. The team got a new owner, moved to Brooklyn, and even got Jay-Z to become a minor owner and opened their new arena with a concert. The only problem was the Nets still kind of sucked. While they finished their first season with a 49 and 33 record, they lost to the Bulls in the first round. Their team lacked superpower. It was also pretty old. When 38 year old Jerry Stackhouse is playing 15 minutes a night, you know your team isn't deep. I don't know, maybe he was just signed for his voice. By the dawn's early light. Not gonna lie, he had it. Anyway, the Nets wanted stars on their team. And that's just what Boston had, stars, aging, past their prime, but still. The Celtics were looking to rebuild after winning a single championship with the big three and coming up short in the years later. Danny Ainge, who was never too sentimental, wanted to offload KG, Pierce, and the rest of their core so they could start fresh. To rebuild a team, one needs draft picks. You see, each team had something the other team wanted. And while Billy King was the GM, it was the Nets owner who really wanted Pierce and KG. The funny thing is that the Celtics didn't really ask for a lot in the beginning. As the Celtics co-owner, Wick Grosbeck explained to CNBC, I think we originally were going to get one unprotected first round pick, Grosbeck recalled. I said, go back and get another one. So Danny Ainge went back and got another pick. And guess what? Grosbeck said, another one. And that kept happening until the Nets gave up their 2014 first rounder, 2016 first rounder, 2017 pick swap, and a 2018 first rounder. Oh, they also traded all of these guys as well. Gerald Wallace, Chris Humphreys, Chris Joseph, Marshawn Brooks, Keith Bogans. The Nets in return got Paul Pierce at 36, Kevin Garnett at 37, and Jason Terry at 36. Boston fans, including the ultimate fan, were not too happy. My first reaction though, Paul Pierce, drafted by the team in 1998, played the last 15 seasons, was somebody that I was hoping was gonna retire with the Celtics. That's only happened a handful of times where you have somebody who's drafted, plays 15, 16 years, same team retires. So just to see him on another team would be weird. KG's another guy who's gonna get his number retired. I, I thought this was 35 cents in the dollar. I have a feeling he'll get over that pretty soon. But the Nets, on the other hand, were pretty excited about their team. The management hoped that with these three, Brooke Lopez, Joe Johnson, and Deron Williams, they could instantly compete for the title. But while they had high hopes, that's not what happened. They actually had five fewer wins than the year before, lost in the East semis to Miami, and managed to lose all three players from the trade in the next two years. They also spent a better part of the decade being one of the worst teams in the league with nothing to show for it. But the Celtics and their fans had a change of heart. The draft picks from this trade allowed them to draft Jalen Brown with that unprotected 2016 first round pick from Brooklyn, draft Jason Tatum using their 2017 first round swap, which turned out to be the number one pick in the 2017 draft. They then traded that number one pick to Philadelphia for the number three pick in the 2017 draft. And along with that, they got a 2019 first round draft, pick, which turned into Romeo Langford. Also, they got to trade for Kyrie Irving. You see, they traded Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Zizic, and that unprotected 2018 first round pick we talked about earlier. And then to finish it off, they got to trade for Derek White. They traded Josh Richardson, Romeo Langford, and a pick for him sum things up, the Celtics built a championship caliber core while the Nets rented a few past their prime stars for a year and a half. The winner is pretty obvious, but Billy King claims that this trade was all part of a plan to get Kevin Durant. Think what you will of that. Anyways, next up. 
Next up, we have the Kyrie Irving for Isaiah Thomas trade. The Celtics received Kyrie Irving, and the Cleveland Cavaliers received Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Ante Zizic, and Brooklyn's 2018 pick. Can we talk about my uh, my Celtics? <laughs> Kyrie Irving and Isaiah Thomas. I mean, to quickly start it off, one was the first pick of his draft and the other was the last, but don't get it twisted. They were running the Eastern Conference between 2015 and 2017. Kyrie was going to the finals every year with LeBron, while IT was doing things we haven't seen since AI was in his prime. One wanted to be traded, and the other really didn't. I'll leave my video on the whole IT situation in the description below, so you can check it out later if you're interested. After three straight finals with LeBron and one chip under his belt, Kyrie wanted out, like really wanted out. According to some sources, he didn't want LeBron in Cleveland from day one. He wanted to have his team, write his own story, and be his own man. With LeBron and him on the same team, that simply wasn't possible. Did you speak to LeBron James or talk to LeBron James before you, before you and your representatives met with ownership and let them know that you wanted out? Huh. Chances are, if you don't speak to somebody about it, they might take it personally. Yeah. Do you care about that at all? No. On the other hand, Danny Ainge was having a problem negotiating a deal with Isaiah Thomas, whose contract was expiring soon and who wanted a max extension. I mean, I'm a, I'm a max guy, so I, I deserve the max. And Ainge wasn't really sure if he was worth it, considering his health. When Ainge heard Kyrie was on the trading block, he got to business. The deal is agreed to Kyrie Irving to the Boston Celtics and Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, Ante Zizek, and the 2018 first round pick. The trade has sparked a lot of reactions with many questioning Boston's motives. The other guys just posted memes. Yeah, that's NBA Twitter for you. Not sure how many people remember this, but Boston did seem like they won this trade by a landslide. While they did lose the first two games of the season and had their second star Hayward suffer a massive injury, the Celtics then went on a 16 game winning streak. They were looking like the team that would finally snap LeBron's final streak. Kyrie also improved defensively and seemingly became a leader for the young team. He was playing the best basketball of his career, averaging 25 points, four rebounds, and five assists in less than 30 minutes on the floor. For the Cavs, the trade was seen as a gamble due to Thomas's hip injury and impending free agency. IT missed a good deal of games too due to surgery. But the same thing happened to the Celtics, with Kyrie suffering an injury later in the year and having to miss the playoffs. When you're Kyrie and you say, I want to leave LeBron James and go be the man somewhere, he's had an excellent season, the Celtics had an excellent season, but he wasn't able to make it through the season. However, things still went well for Boston. Led by their young duo of Tatum and Brown, the Celtics managed to go to the Eastern Conference Finals, where they would lose to LeBron and the Cavs, but still, they had something. Well, that's how it seemed, at least. In October 2018, Irving expressed his intention to resign with the Celtics. You guys will have me back. I plan on resigning here next year. Oh! So. However, as the season progressed, tensions and frustrations within the team became more evident, particularly highlighted by an incident where Irving expressed, let's say, displeasure towards Gordon Hayward. Tatum, fall away, baseline, no. Magic win. The internal dynamics combined with Kyrie's personal reflections following his grandfather's passing led to a change in his stance by February 2019. What went through your mind when you just heard Kyrie? That Kyrie's gone. That Kyrie Irving will not be in Boston next year. That's the first thing that jumped to my mind. Kyrie ironically went to the Nets to team up with Kevin Durant and later James Harden. So yeah, Billy King's plan actually worked out after all. See, the man wasn't that crazy. With the Nets, Kyrie played some really good games, refused to play others, and burned some sage. I'm mad Phil Jackson used to come in with something called sage that smelled like weed to me. I don't know what weed like. But on the Cavalier side, numerous other players have been acquired through subsequent trades involving the original assets from the Kyrie Irving deal. Let's go over them. First, we have Colin Sexton, who came from the 2018 pick that Cleveland acquired in the Kyrie Irving trade. They also got Larry Nance Jr. and Jordan Clarkson, which came to the Cavaliers from the Lakers in exchange for Isaiah Thomas, Channing Frye, and a 2018 first round pick. And then there was Rodney Hood, part of a three-team deal that resulted in Hood and George Hill joining the Cavaliers. Sacramento got Amon Shumper in a second-round pick, and to Utah, they got Jay Crowder, Derrick Rose, and some second-round pick swaps. Essentially, the Cavaliers transformed Jay Crowder, acquired in the Kyrie Irving trade, into Rodney Hood through these transactions. I guess the Cavs won in the long term. Well, at least the Cavs owner, Dan Gilbert, certainly thought so. He felt like they killed it with the trade. Yeah, think of that what you will. 
All right, we have the Jimmy Butler to the 76ers trade. The Sixers received Jimmy Butler and Justin Patton, and the Wolves received Dario Saric, Robert Covington, Jared Bayless, and a 2022 second round pick. While Jimmy Butler was a low first round pick, in just four short years, he became a baller. After six years spent in the Windy City, he was a three-time All-Star, All-NBA, All-Defensive, and Most Improved Player of the Award winner. In the post-MVP Rose years, the Bulls were looking to rebuild, so on the draft night of 2017, they sent Jimmy Butler to the Wolves alongside their draft selection, which turned out to be the 16th pick Justin Patton, all for Zach Levine, Chris Dunn, and the Wolves' number seven pick, Laurie Markkinen. In Minnesota, Butler was reunited with his old mentor, Thibodeau, and the hype was real. In the first season, Butler was on fire, leading the team in scoring with 22.2 points per game and earning his fourth consecutive All-Star selection. He was so committed to the game that he sat out the All-Star game just to stay fresh for the season's grind. The Timberwolves made the playoffs, but were eliminated in the first round, setting the stage for a tumultuous offseason. Butler felt the Wolves' two young stars, Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns, weren't playing to the best of their abilities. By September 2018, reports of Butler's trade request surfaced, with preferred destinations being the Knicks, Nets, and Clippers. The situation became even more bizarre when Andrew Wiggins' brother Nick and Steven Jackson got into a social media beef over the situation. I'm Andrew Wiggins. Say big bro. I don't think you should have sent that tweet out. Why you say that? Shit, because you know, Jimmy Butler, man, he, he played with a lot. Let's skip that part. And then there's the practice. You know what I'm talking about, the practice. It became a part of NBA folklore, but just in case you're really new to this, after requesting a trade, Butler joined a practice late and opted to play with the end of the bench players, leading them to a surprise victory over the starters. Um, targeting coach Tom Thibodeau, teammates like Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins, that you told GM Scott Layton, quote, you effing need me. Jimmy is an intelligent and well-calculated man. He allegedly stormed right out of practice after that game and went to his house to give that interview you heard a second ago to Rachel Nichols. Jimmy gone. <laughs> Jimmy gone. Uh, Jimmy at home. We, we keep playing. We have practice for like another hour. We all showering. We go in the locker room, ESPN pop up. You know what time it is. Rachel Nichols and Jimmy Butler on TV. We like, what the? F <laughs> allegedly, of course. So after all that talk, shouting and drama, what did the Wolves get? The finalized trade sent Butler and Justin Patton to Philadelphia in exchange for Robert Covington, Dario Saric, Jared Bayless, and a 2022 second round draft pick. After the trade, Covington and Saric played well, with the latter eventually being traded to the Phoenix Suns. Jared Bayless played a limited role before moving on. That 2022 second rounder turned out to be this man whose name I can't pronounce. It's a running joke, just go along with it. And who also hasn't played in the league. So yeah. Jimmy ended up to Philly to form a big three, eh, well, not quite, a slightly larger three with Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. And how did that turn out? A lot was going through my head, man, and I already knew how I believe it would have worked out if that shot wouldn't have went in. And we go into overtime and we win. In other words, not so good. But if we have to grade the trade overall though, Philly A plus, Timberwolves F minus, 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 minus. All right, guys, we have the Kawhi Leonard and DeMar DeRozan trade. The Raptors received Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green. The Spurs received DeMar DeRozan, Jakob Pertl, and the 2019 protected first round pick. All right, so the 2017 through 2018 NBA season was all fun and games for Kawhi. <laughs> <laughs> Injuries were a huge problem. Leonard suffered an ankle injury during the Western Conference Finals in May of 2017. However, the more significant issue that contributed to his prolonged absence and the subsequent fallout with the Spurs was his quadriceps tendinopathy, which became a major concern leading into the 2017 through 2018 NBA season. Kawhi Leonard's quadriceps tendinopathy is a condition that affects the tendon linking the thigh muscle to the kneecap, leading to knee pain. Whoa. Don't look at me like a specialist, I just know that it's not good. At the time of the trade, Leonard was recognized as one of the NBA's premier two-way players. His stats before the trade during the 2016 through 2017 season, his last full season with the Spurs, boasted impressive averages of 25.5 points, 5.8 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. He also did stuff like this. From uh, Rudy Gay a while ago, and now from Ben McLemore. He's got it out in front, and there those quick, long arms he's got. Before acquiring Kawhi Leonard, the Toronto Raptors were in a challenging spot. They had achieved regular season success, but consistently fell short in the playoffs, particularly struggling against no team but one man, LeBron James. If, if he gets you down, he will bury you. If he starts feeling it and, and starts smelling your blood, 
he will bury you. As we briefly mentioned earlier, in the 2017 through 2018 NBA season, Kawhi Leonard faced significant challenges due to his right quadriceps injury, which sidelined him for the first 27 games. He returned briefly but was soon placed back on the injured list, leading to a tense situation within the Spurs organization. This culminated in Leonard's request for a trade amidst disagreements over his injury management, the Toronto Raptors seeking change after repeated playoff disappointments, and the departure of LeBron James from the Eastern Conference, decided to trade for Leonard. I am so depressed right now about my Raptors. Despite having a talented roster with key players like DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry, the team couldn't make a significant impact in the postseason. But the King was on the move. He was moving west, and there, the Raptors saw an opportunity. A championship window emerged. They sent DeMar DeRozan, Jakob Pertl, and a protected first round pick to the Spurs in exchange for Leonard and Danny Green. The move was met with mixed reactions, as Kawhi had expressed a preference for playing in LA and had concerns about his injury status. But still, the man is a professional, and he played. <laughs> Kawhi's arrival in Toronto dramatically transformed the Raptors. In the 2018 through 2019 season, Leonard played at an MVP level. He also did a lot of stuff like this. Mechanics are excellent. Yeah, Great. Oh my goodness, what a play. He elevated his play even higher in the playoffs, where he did stuff like this. By Simmons, is this the dagger? In the short term, the Raptors clearly came out on top by winning the NBA championship in 2019, largely thanks to Leonard's MVP caliber performance throughout the playoffs. Leonard's impact was immediate and transformative, proving his worth as a top-tier NBA talent. The Spurs hoped that DeRozan could fill the void left by Leonard. DeRozan, a consistent scorer and playmaker, contributed significantly to the Spurs but couldn't elevate the team to the same heights that Kawhi had. The Spurs signed and traded DeRozan to the Chicago Bulls, acquiring a 2025 first-round pick, which turned into Keldon Johnson, and veterans Al Farouk Amino and Thaddeus Young. While the Spurs weren't complete losers, because in the long term this sent them into rebuild mode and caused them to get Wembenyama, it's still safe to say that the Raptors for sure won this trade. Indubitably. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that last one was a doozy. But this next one, we have the Chris Paul to Clippers trade in 2011. The Clippers received Chris Paul in two second round picks. The Hornets became Pelicans in the 2013 season, received Eric Gordon, Al Farouk Aminu, Chris Kamen, and Minnesota's 2012 unprotected first round pick. CP3 is a familiar face in my videos. And here's another story about him. After six seasons with the Hornets, Paul asked for a trade, partially because of concerns about the team's future and partially because of potential relocation talks. As some of you may recall, New Orleans was stuck in limbo, being owned by the NBA league and looking for a new owner. And as you may remember, CB3 was almost traded to the Los Angeles Lakers in a deal that would have paired him with Kobe Bryant. However, NBA commissioner David Stern vetoed the trade, citing basketball reasons and the league's ownership of the Hornets at the time. I said that New Orleans would not make the trade uh, that had been proposed to them. And was that the right move to make? You know, you buy a ticket and see. We'll see how it works out. Leading to one of the NBA's biggest what ifs, which we actually made a whole video about. The trade that went through sent Chris Paul and two second round picks to the Clippers. In return, the Hornets received Eric Gordon, Al Farouk Aminu, Chris Kamen, and Minnesota's unprotected 2012 first round pick, which was later used to select the fan favorite Austin Rivers. Moving on, Paul's arrival in LA transformed the Clippers into instant contenders, giving rise to the Lob City era alongside Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan. Chris is a fantastic player. I mean, they, they've made a great addition. And of course, you know him personally. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely do. And uh, I know he's happy to finally move on with his career. Despite their exciting play, the Clippers never advanced past the Western Conference semifinals during Paul's tenure. A lot of times, and, and me and Blake absolutely had our issues here and there or whatnot, but um, I, I actually appreciated it. The assets acquired by New Orleans had mixed results. Eric Gordon showed promise but was hampered by injuries. Chris Kamen left after one season, Al Farouk Aminu didn't meet expectations, and Austin Rivers jumped ship and somehow made his way to the Clippers a couple years after being drafted to the Hornets. This led to the Hornets, later the Pelicans, initially coming away with little to show from the trade. Keyword initially. They did get a consolation prize though. The CP3 trade helped the team become really not good. During the shortened 2011 through 2012 season, the team managed to score less than 90 points per game and win only 21 out of 66 games played. But that gave them good odds at the draft lottery. The trade inadvertently aided the Hornets in securing the number one pick in the 2012 NBA draft, which they used to select Anthony Davis. With the first pick in the 2012 NBA draft, the New Orleans Hornets select Anthony Davis. 
although Davis also eventually requested a trade. But hey, the Pelicans managed a more favorable deal in return, acquiring Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, Josh Hart, and DeAndre Hunter. So trading CP3 for next to nothing kind of paid off, but it's still safe to say that the Clippers won that trade. Oh, and you want to know what else pays off? Subscribing to the sponsor of today's video, Basketball Poetry. Now, Basketball Poetry isn't your ordinary newsletter. It was created by my friend Mike, a former finance pro turned basketball savant, which I actually read every time he drops a post, to the point where it's part of my weekly routine. Fed up with the same old narratives? Well, Mike decided to channel his passion for basketball into creating content that goes way, I mean way beyond surface level analysis. Do you want to know why Wemby might become the first rookie defensive player of the year? Or breaking down every contender's biggest flaws with a deep analysis on each team? Well, Mike's got you. Or maybe Maybe even how we can actually save the all-star game. Yeah, I don't even know how we're going to do that one, Mike, but I'll leave it up to you. Mike has literally done the work for you. As an NBA fan, this is literally must-see content. It really doesn't get better than this. So to keep your NBA knowledge fresh and learn more about the game weekly, sign up with my link in the description below and get the scoop twice a week straight to your inbox. By using my link below, all new members get 10% off a monthly or yearly subscription. Support basketball poetry, enrich your NBA discourse, support small creators, and keep enjoying top tier NBA content with my link below. All right, back to the video. James Harden for Kevin Martin trade. The Rockets received James Harden, Cole Aldridge, Lazar Hayward, and Daquan Cook. And the Thunder receives Kevin Martin, Jeremy Lamb, two first round picks, one in 2013 and one in 2014, and one second round pick in 2014. Here's another huge trade that everyone has an opinion on, which isn't surprising, since the trade had a huge effect on the future of both teams and the league as a whole. Here's the deal. Sam Presti and the Thunder Brass were concerned by the NBA's new collective bargaining agreement, which introduced a steep luxury tax making it financially burdensome for teams, especially those in smaller markets like OKC, to sustain star-studded rosters. If you own an NBA team and you have less money than the other owners, and the other owners want to be able to go over the salary cap, the rich owner says, well, what if we got taxed extra and we gave that extra tax money to you? You as the broke-ass NBA team owner that you are are going to say, it's a pretty good idea. This is in the NBA CBA. All that luxury tax money gets spread out through the teams that were good and stayed below the tax line. With Durant's salary bumping up and significant contracts already committed to Westbrook and Ibaka, keeping Harden on the payroll seemed like a fiscal nightmare. I wasn't really hip to the business side of it. Like, I wasn't really locked in with the front office to like, yo. Despite the looming deadline for Harden's extension and the Thunder's month-long negotiation dance, the suddenness of the deal caught many off guard. The Thunder, under the strategic eye of GM Sam Presti, were playing a high-stakes game, aware that teams like the Rockets, Mavericks, and Suns were circling, ready to offer Harden the max. But Oklahoma City still held firm. Their stance was clear to keep the band together. Everyone had to sacrifice a bit, even stars like Durant and Westbrook. But Harden's unwillingness to settle for less than the max led Presti to act swiftly, prioritizing decisiveness over prolonged negotiation. When the sides couldn't come to terms, we know Sam Presti, the Thunder GM, is pretty decisive. So he turned around quickly and today started working on trade. And the Rockets, their interest in James Harden has been known for quite a long time. So uh, they were able to consummate a deal with Houston pretty quickly. While the Thunder secured a hefty return, including multiple first round picks and the promising Jeremy Lamb, it all looked kind of lackluster. Sure, none of us knew that Harden would turn into MVP Harden, not even his teammates. You know, if it works for both sides, then let's just do it. You know what I'm saying? But then you see, because James came off the bench for us, and then you, you see how he plays as a starter. It was just like, hold up. <laughs> now, was that a good that was was that a good move? To, yeah. You know, four or five years later, it was just like, even that next, fuck, the first game, yeah, what, 37? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 35 and 10. 12 like and what? winning games. It was just... This wasn't about assets or contracts, it was about chemistry. The trio of Durant, Westbrook, and Harden wasn't just effective on the court, they were amazing. In just three years of playing together, they managed to get to the finals and give the Heat a good fight. Removing Harden from the equation was more than a roster adjustment. Not to sound dramatic, but it was a fundamental alteration of the team's identity. They were great together, but only became MVPs with their own air to breathe. The Thunder's locker room, the team's dynamics, and their place in the Western Conference hierarchy were all set for a recalibration. All three guys had their MVP seasons. KD. 2013-14 Kia NBA Most Valuable Player, Kevin Durant. Russ. And the winner of the 2017 Kia NBA Most Valuable Player Award is Russell Westbrook. And Harden. And the Kia NBA Most Valuable Player goes to James Harden.
But as a team, OKC still hasn't won anything. Presti's move highlighted a core NBA insight. Team management is as much about mastering dynamics and chemistry as it is about the money. And at the end of the day, the Rockets won this trade and OKC did not. Okay, actually following the same team, we have Serge Ibaka to the Orlando Magic trade. In the 2010s, GMs loved betting on Ibaka. Don't believe me? It's okay. I've kept the receipts. Not only did the OKC management decide to keep Ibaka instead of Harden, but the Orlando Magic traded away what was basically their future for the man. Before KD took off to join the 73-9 and team, after losing to this same team just a month earlier, Oklahoma felt they needed to make some strategic changes. Fortunately for OKC, the Magic was also trying to make some moves in an effort to revitalize their lineup post Dwight Howard era. Orlando, aiming to end a four-year playoff drought, traded Tobias Harris to the Pistons for Brandon Jennings and Ersan Ilyasova. Seeking a defensive complement to Nikola Vucevic, the Magic acquired Ibaka for his defensive abilities and modern offensive skills. Serge Ibaka on the move to Orlando, a glut of picks back. What got this deal done? Uh, Chris, in the last, really here in the last week, Oklahoma City made a decision uh, to explore the market, see what they could get as a return for Serge Ibaka. The trade looked kind of lopsided off the jump. OKC got Victor Oladipo, Ertan Ilyasova, and the rights to DeMontis Sabonis, who was the 11th overall pick in the 2016 NBA draft. Oladipo, who was selected second overall by the Orlando Magic in the 2013 draft, was a key piece in the trade. He spent three years with the Magic, averaging roughly 16 points, four rebounds, and four assists. Although the Magic were playing poorly, Victor Oladipo was still young, and under the right tutelage, could develop into a star. Ilya Silva, a season forward, brought shooting and experience. And Sabonis, a promising young big man with a versatile skill set, offered potential for development. The trio provided OKC with a blend of immediate impact and future growth, bolstering their roster in the post-KD season. But some people love the trade. This one might leave fans a little bit sore, but trust me, big deal. I like this deal. The Magic sending their star guard to Oklahoma City to play for the Thunder. Here's the breakdown. The Magic get Serge Ibaka. All right, he's 26 years old. He's big. He can block shots and shoot the three. The Thunder get Victor Oladipo back on back up. Irsan Ilasova in the man. The Magic drafted tonight. Demontis Sabonis right there. He was drafted 11th overall. Magic fans, you may be scratching your heads, but trust me, this is a big deal and a good deal. Yeah, Dave Pinglor loved it. The head scratcher for a lot of people. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ping. I think. Ibaka's stint with Orlando lasted only half a season before he was traded to the Raptors, leaving the Magic with little return on their investment. Meanwhile, the Thunder leveraged Ibaka's value to obtain Oladipo and Sabonis, later trading them to Indiana for Paul George, who delivered an MVP caliber season with OKC. This series of transactions, particularly George's eventual trade to the Clippers, facilitated by Kawhi Leonard's signing conditions, transformed the Thunder's roster, bringing in Shea Gilgis Alexander and a collection of first round picks, which so far turned into Trey Mann, selected 18th and 21, used to actually get Gordon Hayward, and Jalen Williams, who was selected 12th in 2022. And they still have a few more picks left. I want to begin by thanking, uh, by thanking Serge. And Abaka, his story has a happy ending. He ended up playing with the most fun player of the list, <laughs> and possibly in the entire league, and winning himself a title. I'm here with fun guy. Where's tomorrow? Fun guy, what's up, baby? What it do, baby? Yeah, yo, what do you know? So with that being said, OKC won. Orlando zero. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about isn't a single trade. It's actually the draft night of 2018. Let's get analytical. The 2018 draft arguably deserved more scrutiny for the choices made by the teams with the top two selections. Okay, basically we need to see why these teams passed on Luka. Despite having Kokoshkov, who had previously trained Doncic, helping the Slovenian national team win Eurobasket just a year before the draft, the Suns chose eight. Okay, Aiton was widely anticipated to be the Suns' choice. However, we can see that he didn't fully meet those expectations. DeAndre Aiton, despite being the number one pick with an ideal skill set to complement Devin Booker, hasn't lived up to expectations due to his inconsistency, lack of physicality, and limited offensive arsenal. Kicking out, Durant attacking again, good lead for Aiton. Aiton unable to fit it. Roll down into the post, and Shaman doesn't really have... Aiton's avoidance of aggressive play and insufficient use of ball fakes have constrained his scoring efficiency and ability to exploit mismatches, falling short of the impact expected from a top draft selection. And why did the Kings go with Marvin Bagley? It was basically the Kings being the Kings. 
For starters, the Kings were worried no one wanted to play for them. Yep, you heard that right. For the Kings, the mere fact that Bagley was willing to play for them seemed enough to pick him, despite concerns about his fit and potential. Kings GM Vladi Divac also wasn't known for making the perfect draft choices. Let's see some of his recent picks. Jimmer Fredette, 2011, 10th overall. Picked before Klay Thompson and struggled in the league despite a legendary college career. Thomas Robinson, 2012, 5th overall. Georges Papianis, 2016, 13th overall. Failed to live up to expectations. Yeah, Vlade wasn't known for making perfect life choices either. When I went in the locker room one time to go to the bathroom, he was smoking a cigarette before the game. <laughs> there was also rumors that Vlade passed on Luca because of his feeling towards Luca's father. And then uh, Luca, to Donnie Nelson's credit, he was convinced early and consistently that Luca was by far the best player in that draft class. Donnie will be the first to tell you he did not think he was going to be this dominant this soon, but they saw what they saw early last year and stripped that thing down, basically saying, hey, forget anything we were trying to do. This is going to be all about building around Luca now and they hope for the next 15 years. Yeah, so Atlanta selected Luca with the third pick. The Mavericks are closing in on a trade for Luka Doncic, according to leak sources. But they traded him almost immediately to the Mavericks for Trey Young and a future first round pick. A lot of people liked this trade immediately. The Atlanta Hawks and Dallas Mavericks have agreed in principle to a deal that would send the third pick in the draft from Atlanta to Dallas for the fifth pick and a future first round pick from Dallas to Atlanta. Trey Young will go from the Dallas Mavericks at five to the Atlanta Hawks at three. But many would agree this wasn't such a great trade, just a few years after the trade. Given Luka's immediate impact, Dallas sent only the 10th pick to Atlanta, which was used to select Cam Reddish. The component of the trade later seemed insufficient, given the trajectories of the players involved. Both teams reached their respective conference finals during the rookie contracts of the traded players, leading to long discussions about the trade being a win-win. However, the long-term value and impact of the players involved suggest a more complex assessment. I'll give you one like reason the why the, the Hawks were thinking along those lines, Steph Curry. You see Trey Young, oh, yeah, everybody from feels Golden like State, yeah, he's, he's going to fall into the mold of that type of player. Yes, yeah. The people who Love are saying like, well, we don't know. It's like, we, he just played 90 games against adults in Europe who had been the second yes. best league and he was the, the best player of the of league. The and, and he was yeah. 19. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Right. Yeah. Why do we play yeah, basketball? But, but Trey Young had a good start to the, the college this season well, last year. Lucas' trade value is considered amongst the highest in the league when factoring in his quality, age, and contract length, whereas Trey's value might just cover the investment made for DeJounte Murray, raising questions about the true winner of the trade. Oh, and I gotta talk about Mikael Bridges. Mikael was a Philly boy who grew up a 76ers fan and ended up playing for the local Villanova. In 2018, he entered the draft and looked like an ideal piece to compliment Embiid and Simmons. His mom even worked for the Sixers. Come on, it was perfect. A little too perfect. With the 10th pick in the 2018 NBA Draft, the Philadelphia 76ers select Mikael Bridges from Villanova University. The Sixers selected him 10th overall. His mom was ecstatic. They both gave an interview, a feel-good story all around. Not the fact that I'm home, you know, I'm just putting a great organization, you know, great coaches, you know. Then the Sixers traded him to the Suns for 16th pick Zaire Smith and a future first rounder. Mikel was so pissed off that he couldn't even smile. What? It's so funny because I know how I smile and I know like my facial yeah. expressions. <laughs> if you see the pictures I got with the Phoenix hat on, like they can smile in a world like just like, <laughs> like whatever. Like Zaire Smith played a whopping 13 games in two seasons for the Sixers and was traded to Detroit in 2020. Mikel, on the other hand, has turned into a 20 point scorer and one of the best defensive players in the league. I think the situation is best summed up by this comment on the Mikel Bridges draft video. And shout out to Bill Simmons for nailing the 2018 draft and kind of inspiring this section. I don't understand. We, we all watch basketball every May and June, and the best teams always have these dudes who can create shots for themselves and other people who are perimeter guys. Year after year, that's who wins the title. And then somebody takes the center first. I don't understand it. Right. And you, should be, you should be falling all over yourself to get Doncic. Well, a bit more than kind of. Well, those were just some of the trades. The 2010s had even more terrible ones. We didn't mention Rondo, Howard, or any of the dozen players involved in some of these strangest trades in NBA history. If you want me to do a sequel and or cover a different decade, let me know in the comments. Hmm, kinda not sure how to end this video. Well, I guess for now you can follow and enjoy the ride.